Good morning. It's nine o'clock. I'm calling to order the Wednesday, February 8th meeting of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Government's Board of Directors. Mr. Director, do we have a quorum? Uh, we do. What I would suggest is maybe we do self-introductions around the room. We need seven for a quorum, and I count that many at least in the room, and we have a few online as well. Okay, we'll start with introductions on the room, and then we'll go to elected officials online. I'm Sharon Thompson. I'm the mayor of the City of Fountain and chairman of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Mr. Elsner. Dick Elsner, Park County Vice Chair. Andy Gunning, Executive Director of PPACG. Roland Gardine, Mayor Pro Tem of Callahan. Todd Dixon, Mayor of Green Mountain Falls. John Graham, Mayor of City of Manatee Springs. You go. Shane Ferguson of CDOT. Nancy Hingham, City Council District 5 for Colorado Springs. Jeff Moser, City of Cripple Creek. <coughs> oh, it's me. Yeah. Oh, Yolanda Avila, City Council, Colorado Springs, District 4. Okay, and elected officials online, if you could kind of just open your mic and introduce yourselves, please. Mitch Lakine, Mayor of Monument. Glenn Havener, Mayor of Palmer Lake. Holly Williams, El Paso County Commissioner and Second Vice. I'm sorry, I'm not there in person this morning. Good morning, Cami Bremer, El Paso County. Good morning, Deetra Duncan, Fountain City Council at Large, alternate. And Madam Chair, we also have uh, Trustee Walker from Rama. it looks like. And that'll be it. All right, thank you. All righty. Um, we have move on to item two, agenda approval. What would the board like to do with the agenda? Wanda, move to approve. Mayor Dixon, second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, that takes us on to item three, public comment and presentations. Item A, public comments. Public comments can be made before or during the meeting. Public comments during the meeting is limited to three minutes and can be done at the meeting location or remotely by using the posted Microsoft link. Individuals are encouraged to notify the meeting organizer before the meeting, the start of the meeting with the agenda item they'd like to comment on. Public comments can be submitted before the meeting via email ppacg at ppacg.org for distribution to the committee members. Do we have anyone in the audience that is wishing to um, use public comment time. Good morning, Madam Chair. Jody Barker, your AAA Director. I would love to take this opportunity to introduce our three new chairs for our um, Regional Advisory Council. Uh, Marilyn Massey, uh, she's been in Colorado Springs for about 11 years. She's a retired attorney, and she's been on the Regional Advisory Council now for about eight years, and she will serve this year as our chair. So we're really pleased to have her uh, continuing to grow with us and, and serve in this, uh, this capacity. Uh, then I have um, uh, Deanna Rumsey. And she will be our chair for our uh, mobility coordinating committee. And she is a staff member um, and advocacy specialist for the independent center. So we're really pleased that she is able to join us uh, both on the board, but also serve in the capacity of chair for MCC this year. And then uh, directly to my left is uh, Dayton Romero. Uh, he has uh, been on the uh, Pikes Peak Commission on Aging now for a couple of years. He will serve as chair this year. Uh, he has a very extensive uh, history with aging services, uh, working with both Silver Key and uh, AARP Colorado, serving a ten, uh, a ten county, or excuse me, a ten state region, uh, working in uh, the Oats program, which is technology for seniors. And so we're just really pleased to introduce to the board our chairs for this year, serving our seniors and our uh, as chair. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much and congratulations and I appreciate everybody stepping up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else in the audience for public comments? Do we have anyone online for public comments? If you do, please raise your hand. IT, anybody? And Madam Chair, no one has emailed and indicated beforehand. So. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll go on to item B, uh, military installation reports. Do we have any military members online that would like to give a report?
Okay, hearing none, we will move on. Um, if someone pops on, you're more than welcome to come back to that. Okay, consent items. We have um, items A, B, C, and D on the consent agenda today. Um, those are all going to be um, acted on as a whole unless there's anything called up on discussion by a board member or a citizen wishing to address the board. What would the uh, board like to do with the consent items? Move approval, Commissioner Williams. I'll second John Graham. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the consent items. Is there any discussion? No, are you just putting your mic on to vote? Okay, all right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that takes us on to item five, information items. First item, A, air quality update strategies for the 2023. Mr. Gunning. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you'll recall that you got a briefing on air quality issues last month. Uh, Dina Wojtek, our contractor, she's with us today, but I was going to handle uh, this part of the conversation um, as a kind of a further update, you'll recall last month we talked about, Dina gave a good update on some of the challenges that we have around ground level ozone standards that are set by EPA, and that a lot of the emissions that we're dealing with that go into our two monitors at um, the Air Force Academy and at Manitou Springs, they come from uh, influences outside of our, our control. They come from other parts of our state, other states, and even international emissions, and then obviously wildfire smoke as well. Uh, so we, we talked about how uh, for February, just wanted to give a brief update on what we're trying to do about that as far as um, controlling or reducing emissions that are within our purview within within our region. Uh, the first slide is just a little bit of a recap of um, some of the challenges we're, we're facing with the federal standard. Um, Jared, if you can hit the button one more time, I think it shows what we need to achieve in 2023. Not to go down um, into the weeds again on this, but you'll recall that it's a three-year average that EPA looks at, and we've got to uh, keep our standard at or below 70 parts per billion. Um, and our three-year average so far is uh, actually above that, that level. We understand that EPA is going to go through a review process in 2024 to see what our three-year average is in 2021, 20, 22, and 23. So this year is a big year. Um, the red numbers that you see on the right part of this chart show what we need to achieve in 2023, where we can't exceed those numbers, 68 parts per billion at the Air Force Academy, uh, monitor and 66 parts per billion in Manitou Springs, which is lower than what we achieved in 2022. 2022, I think we had a pretty good year where we didn't have as much wildfire influence, had a pretty good monsoon. Uh, so that was all good news, but we have to do even better this year. So um, it, it's you know, we've got a, a little bit of an uphill, um, uphill battle, but um, we're trying to lean into the strategies that we can for where we do control emissions that we generate within our um, within our region. Okay, next uh, next slide. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, this thing's pretty far up. Uh, you may you may come to it um, in a later chart. So my apologies for maybe jumping in at this point. But it, as I recall, I, I think it was maybe in the previous PPACG meeting, or it was in some previous meeting, where it was identified what the background parts per billion ozone is in the region, which is somewhere around fifty, and. I'm just wondering, uh, I don't know how that compares to what the background would be in South Carolina, you know, or or some other state. And also just kind of looking to see if we can re-verify that that's what our background ozone level would be here. And then, and then does the EPA care or does North Carolina get the same standard as we get and they have a background of 25 and we have a background of 50 and therefore we have to do more? So I'm just concerned about that. And I'm also just want to have it clarified if I'm misunderstanding it. Sure. So there's a lot in that question. Appreciate that. And I'll try to start to answer it as Dina maybe comes up as well. Um, we're, we're very concerned about the background levels as well. And you mentioned a 50-ish. I think that was 50 parts per billion roughly. But it's actually as a percentage wise, we think the background ozone that we start with from wildfire influence and international and other states influence is higher than that as a percentage. It, it may be closer to 80 to 85 percent. We think based on some course modeling that EPA has done in the past. That, that's oh. what their assumption has been. So the, so the 50 was not a PPB. It was a percent of it was a PPB, so the actual percentage is closer to, we eight, think, 80%. Eight, but 80%, we, want to, yeah. we want to dig into that further to find out what we are being held to. Because I think um, 
and this is where Dina maybe can help as well. I think Eastern states actually don't have that same level of background that we in Western states necessarily have if we're dealing with more influences like wildfire smoke and potentially international emissions from China and India. Dina maybe can correct a little bit on that. But well, and I'll I'll express my concern and just 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 a little bit of the engineer in me coming out, right? Sure. If you're trying to hold everybody to the same standard, you should be taking a certain number over the background number as the standard. You should not be taking an absolute number. Uh, and I just am so if I'm if I'm misunderstanding it, I'm happy to to be corrected. But I would also, you know, if they if if what I think is going on is yeah. what is in fact going on, we're being forced to do stuff more in a more extreme manner than maybe other parts of the country are being forced to do it and that's unfair so i just want to make sure i understand this sure i well the standard is the standard across the country regardless of which state you're in that's the clean air act or i got to tell you that just sounds like a federal agency's uh way that they do business so as, as dina comes up to do a presentation i am seeing some uh, at least one hand online i'm going to ask everybody if we can hold the questions and comments and let Dana get through her sure. whole presentation and they may get answered at some point in the presentation sure. and um and and uh, or we may have similar questions so Dana thank you for being here today and I'm, am I saying your name right yes okay thank you yes can you hear me okay Dina Voitak with Two Roads Environmental um I think you're right to question that. I think your initial question as to do we know um, what that is, um, is something that we should look at more closely. Um, last time when I presented that information is based on 2013 data, then EPA then modeled in, in 2017, and now they're relying on it. So it's outdated data. The models have changed. Emission inventories have changed. They haven't looked more closely at this area because you have been in attainment. They've been focused on the areas that have not been in attainment. So I think that's one of the first things that should be done is going back and re and updating that initial look as to what is the background now. You know, that was 2013 data, 2017 modeling into 2023. So again, modeling is projecting into the future as to what we think it's going to be based on meteorology and climate and all kinds of things and growth. So, so again, I think going back and looking, re-looking that, that, that analysis and maybe updating it with uh, current, you know, methodologies and current data, data would be a good start. Does that help? Yeah, good, good points. And that's part of why we wanted to talk about well, what, we're, what we're all doing as a region to try to reduce what we do control, because I think that does help us in these conversations with EPA and with the state to say, you know, look, we don't have a whole lot of bandwidth or headroom to really make a huge difference because of these outside influences, but we're doing what we can. OK, we're putting our best foot forward within reason to try to reduce what we do control. So try to, you know, let's can you give us some relief from that part of the standard? And we're not sure if that's possible or not, but um, it's that's been our approach. Hang on just a minute, Commissioner. Do you have did you get have anything else left in your presentation that you wanted to give to us today? Or it's Andy's presentation, and I think right. he's going yeah. to get to the okay. pie charts that yeah. might show those numbers again to refresh. Uh, I'm not sure if I kept those in here, but we can maybe pull those up again. Um, but yeah, why don't we why don't we get through the next couple of slides? And this will be super brief because um, just wanted to give a little bit of background how we are part of this um, ozone advanced program that EPA administers. We, it gives us a chance to work with our um, other partners across the country that are in the same boat, that are on the same on the edge of non-attainment but aren't there yet. So we um, through this ozone advanced program that we signed on to in uh, January 2021, it just gives us a chance to collaborate with those other regions and with EPA to find out what's working elsewhere. Um, and also it demonstrates our, our commitment that we're trying to do what we can within reason for the stuff that we that we generate within our, our region. Um, we've got to give periodic updates back to EPA on what we're doing and if we think they're effective or not. Um, so I've been working that through our regional air quality committee and, and with other partners uh, as well. So that's part of why I wanted to bring this back to the board as well, just to kind of give you a heads up as far as what we're collecting from our local jurisdictions. Um, next slide. 
And these are some of the measures that um, everybody's been reporting so far, whether it's our local jurisdictions, uh, CSU, military installations, um, and others. And I think this is a good example of us being just a convening body. We're not implementing any measures, but our local jurisdictions are, and they're identifying um, what they're doing consistent with the ozone advance plan to try to reduce emissions that we that we do generate. And again, it gives us a chance to kind of put our best foot forward and show, look, we're doing what we can in a lot of different sectors, um, whether it's clean energy transition, and I have a couple of examples there of what's happening in Shriver and CSU and City of Fountain, um, or vehicle fleet replacement, a lot of activity there with our larger jurisdictions and with MMT. Um, CSU as a rebate program for energy efficiency, appliances and heating and cooling systems. Uh, we're doing a lot as far as wildfire mitigation. So we're leaning into a lot of these different um, measures and, and trying to move the needle again with the stuff that um, that we do have some control over. Uh, the, la the last two are ones that I just wanted to mention um, a little more uh, broadly that uh, so a couple of areas where we're trying to help out and really kind of lean into uh, some measures for this year are a better job of coordinating around public awareness to let our communities and our businesses know what we all can do to reduce emissions. There are a lot of simple steps that we could take um, on our own, whether it's individual households or individual businesses to manage emissions, especially when we see some forecasted bad days that are on the horizon. Um, so we're going to do a better job uh, coordinating with our um, information folks and our marketing folks to really get the word out to the community on what some of those steps can be. And the final one is, um, what are some regional travel options that employees and major employers in the region may want to know about? You know, we're not, um, we don't have a, a heavily heavy reliance on our transit system, but if we can uh, build some awareness around some of the options that are available there, especially with our major employers, um, there might be a way to help move the needle a little bit again when we have some pretty bad days on the horizon. Um, not that we're all going to end up using transit uh, this summer, but if we can move the needle and have it tick up a couple of percentage points, that could make a difference. So um, we're going to look at ways to really uh, lean into kind of a voluntary um, approach to reducing travel where um, where it makes sense. And then last slide. Um, this just kind of highlights uh, one of the reasons that we need to do this. I mean, obviously it's a public health issue dealing with ground level ozone, but also it's got economic impacts if we end up in non-attainment. Um, and we've found a number of studies across the country where they've really tried to measure and estimate what that impact would be. Uh, most recent one was in Oklahoma City where they've wrapped up a study last year where it estimate, they estimated about a $9.6 billion to $15 billion impact over a 20 to 30 year period if they end up in non-attainment. Um, so the big takeaway there is uh, the line at the bottom is the cost of remaining in attainment is less than the cost of meeting non-attainment and maintenance area requirements. Because um, in that case, we're gonna be forced to do certain things um, by EPA with the plan that we would have to come up with. Um, so we're trying to do a, a pretty complete inventory of all the things that our local communities are doing so we can report that back to EPA. And again, um, with the hope that uh, we can show we're doing what we can, but uh, at some point we need some relief. I don't know that we could go so far as to see that uh, we need to update the Clean Air Act. That might be a bridge too far, but if there's other things we can do in working with the state and work, working with our federal delegation, um, you know, we're certainly uh, looking at those opportunities too. So anything, Dina, that we should mention that I didn't mention? I don't know that we've got the pie chart showing the breakdown of uh, source emissions, but that is one thing I think we really need to focus on as well in the short term is really get a better handle on what is going into the two monitors that that we have. I I would um, respond back to the, the question ultimately is how does the background here relate to other areas? And I will say that it really depends on um, a lot of different variables. And so it's really hard to compare um, states or areas that don't have, you know, the beautiful, beautiful mountains range that we love. Um, you know, a lot of times the winds just blow right across that area, right? And here, um, sometimes the wind blows and traps things against the mountains that we love. And so, you know, there's that, there's, there's meteorology, you know, that differs with every area. There's, you know, different areas have different amounts of emissions and um, from, you know, whether it's industry or transportation or, or what have you. And so it, it's really hard to compare if that's something that you choose to, you know, want to look into deeper. That's something that we could do. I just don't know that it's going to give you the answers um, that you you ultimately are looking for. 
OK, I'm not seeing any hands online. I want to make sure that we kind of go back and forth with the online people and in, in the room. Mm -hmm. OK, Madam Chair, um, Mayor Havner did put in a comment in the chat. I don't know if the mayor wanted to speak out. I'll leave that up to you. Well, yeah, just okay. uh, <clears throat> just to the question that I have is how does altitude play a role in the EPA standard? Because we're one of the highest altitudes in the country and ozone rises. So how does that affect our area compared to when Stan was talking about the East Coast and people at sea level? I think that's a good question. I think, um, and this is Dina Boyd talk again. Um, I think it depends on how what models you're using. I mean, they they use different models that kind of project sometimes that there's mixing um, the good ozone that's way up high. Sometimes because of the turbulent winds um, over the mountains can can sometimes be driven right back down to the lower or to ground level, and that's when it's harmful to us breathing. And so, you know, trying to better um, capture that and understand how that works and and feed that into the models. I think newer models are are getting better at doing that. Um, but again, that that's a great question is how how are we different? You know, and a, a lot of it is going to come back to again, your your topography, your meteorology, you know, whether there were wildfires that year that were contributing to it, you know, what what was going on when when you were seeing the high high readings. Thank you. I just think that there should be an accommodation for that because our topography is unlike anyone else's. That's a that's a great comment. I, I see you. <laughs> You've already had one turn. <laughs> I want to make sure we get around the room if anybody else. Uh, Commissioner Williams. Uh, yeah, I know we had talked about the mountains and um, on the comment of topography. I promise you we don't have anywhere near the problems that Utah has in the winter um because they get the inversion in february and um, they can go two three weeks without seeing the sun sometimes so um we do have an interesting topography but utah has a very similar topography and sometimes even worse yeah that salt lake city is sitting right in the middle of a bowl so um it just kind of stays in there you're right councilmember donaldson Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The the pie charts that are up here uh, that we're looking at, it looks like Colorado has four four and a half four point four seven parts which we control, and then I think that's it. Is that right? Then there's offshore Canada, other states, wildfires which we don't necessarily control those unless those are only in the state of Colorado and we still don't really control them. So we're trying to make uh, all the difference out of. Like, what is that? Six percent or of the total? Yeah, somewhere around, um, I think, three to five percent. But <clears throat> so, yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's Colorado man-made emissions. That's yeah. not natural, you know, other kinds of things. And so, you know, what, what that, is the percent? Do we? I guess I can pull out my phone and do it, but it's. I don't. It's ten. Ten percent would be six and a half, and this is four, four point four. So, again, it's it's kind of like. Uh, it's interesting. It just goes right back to what. Uh, Commissioner Vanderwerf pointed out that it may be very hard to achieve goals when you're only working with 7% of the total amount. Um, so just one point that out. Thank you. It, I think I mentioned this last month. And we've mentioned it before because I know it was in the letter that we submitted for an exceptional events exclusion for the wildfires, really bad wildfire season we had back in 2020. But um, our governor is part of the Western Governors Association and one of their policy directives that they've as a group adopted is around this very issue that they as Western states should work with EPA and through Congress to try to have this addressed somehow in the Clean Air Act to take this um, background and wildfire um, 
ozone issue that all the western states are deal dealing with take that take that out of our calculation somehow i don't know how we achieve that uh, we've got maybe a smidge of an opportunity where our governor is now the chair of the western governors association of 20 plus states um so we reminded them when we submitted our letter to the state last year, and we can certainly amplify that. One way to maybe do that as well, as an aside, I should have mentioned as well, um, we're still trying to get a seat on the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, so if folks have anybody in mind that we'd like to maybe have them uh, throw their hat in the ring to be um, appointed to that state commission, I think um, having those conversations at, at that level could, could certainly help. And that application would be online? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. All right. That's a great idea. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Roland Gardeen, Mayor Pro Tem Callahan. You look at this pie chart. This pie chart has actually meant all the Americas here. We're talking about Canada and Mexico. And then uh, you want to get the Air Force Men's 4.47. Then you have state of Colorado 3.06. Uh, I. The ratio here seems to be off due to the fact that you're, you're covering two other countries and then our our country. So, so something don't add up right. So this is what they knew about the emissions from Canada and Mexico. Again, this was back from 2013, or 2013 yes. So, so when they do the modeling, they do grids and they only can account for what's in that grid. They don't do worldwide kinds of um, modeling when they're talking about impacts at these monitors. They do have other models that kind of look at what's happening on a global basis. But you're right. It, it does seem like, you know, there's there's only so much. I think this point is being re made repeatedly here, and it's a good point that there's only so much that can be done um, here in Colorado to affect these numbers. Now, again, I will point out these numbers are outdated and the modeling is outdated. Um, but taking this data, whether you want to just take this data or if you want to update it and, and approaching EPA um, about this is what we're understanding, um, we're trying to understand what we might do about it and how that might impact what we're seeing at the monitors. Um, but it seems like, you know, 80% is initial and boundary con conditions and then, you know, good chunks are coming from other places that are out of um, our authority. What is it that you would have us do to, uh, you know, to address that? And I, I think that is a, a valid next step. I think most people are going to point back to let's go back and get updated data and do updated modeling is yeah. what they're going to say. I agree. One sec. Is there any? OK, no hands raised online. Commissioner Vanderwerth. Yeah, I'm just kind of trying to continue to do more research on this. I'm looking at a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory report from the California Institute of Technology showing that the entire Western United States uh, has very high background ozone levels. In some places, the background alone is almost at the EPA standard. Meaning there's absolutely nothing anybody can do for that area to 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 address what the EPA uh, wants to do. They are significantly lower on the East Coast, according to this report. Uh, and um, so I find it interesting. And this report says very specifically says in it that um, they're using new technology to determine what the background uh, ozone is. They're using satellites now to calculate this at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and the original estimates for background ozone were underestimated, and they're getting more accurate data, and so these numbers are actually higher. So um, it's pretty interesting that the whole point of this study was to address this fact that there's all kind, and it, it talks about it right in here. There's all kinds of public policy action to try to reduce ozone that may be absolutely worthless and do nothing. That's actually what the report talks about. So we might want to start citing this maybe. <laughs> and there may be other sources that'll have similar conclusions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other comments, uh, last comments on this item? Oh. 
Commissioner Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I think actually we might be able to approach this in a way similar to how uh, groups like this can approach a state legislature, which is to get together, put together, you know, a, a policy white paper that we can then actually bring, you know, rather than just sit here and, you know, pound on our tables and say that's not fair. We know it's not fair. We know it, it's never fair. That happens every single time that whether it's the state legislature or the or Congress writes uh, legislation that starts with the chairman of the Empire Environmental Protection Agency shall, because then that leaves all rulemaking up to the agency and it's not written into the law itself. Uh, and and we're subject to whatever the, that rulemaking is. And obviously for the EPA, it's for even further away than it is from the state. But and you know, I guess one of the stronger things that we can do is to make a case and maybe even reach out to some sister cities. Uh, you know, Salt Lake City, Ogden, Utah, other places that are probably dealing and pounding on their tables as well, saying we can't do a thing about this because we sit at high altitude. We have geographic uh, things uh, that cause it to start higher. And if we're starting here and the East Coast is starting oh. here, obviously this isn't an equitable calculation. So uh, I guess, you know, my 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 push would be to you know start with this great information that Stan has here and loop some other experts into it as well and start putting together you know a kind of an academic paper that we can bring to them bring to our governor try to try to get them to help us with this because it's i realize there's a lot of people that want to use this as an opportunity to achieve their specific goals which have nothing to do with actually lowering or even affecting the ozone levels thank you just a point of a question to clarify are you seeing ppacg producing the white paper or working with someone else to do it well i mean Let's start here, as as I guess what I'm saying. I mean, you know, that we are a, a region of this. I don't know if Dr. Cog or, you know, other regional government associations are are faced with the same issue and dealing with the same problems. I assume that some of them are, but as to whether or not that they want to actually say something needs to be changed versus just saying, okay, well, we'll do more, uh, even though doing more will never reach the levels that we want to reach. I mean, I'm I'm a little bit more uh, focused on things that not only things that work, but also is uh, ensuring that the standards that are set are, you know, even attainable. I mean, if it's not attainable, what are we doing? So uh, that, that's, so I guess, yes, I'm suggesting we start here with PPACG, but, uh, but maybe it, it starts with reaching out to some of the other uh, regional transportation groups and uh, you know, the other area councils of governments and see if they're interested as well in putting something together and then see where that might grow. Okay. If could, yeah, Madam Chair, uh, started that great suggestion and two things um, that are kind of in the works already. We had a good meeting a couple of weeks ago. I think it was right after our last board meeting with leadership from CSU, um, Utilities, Chamber of Commerce, City and County around this issue and didn't really come to specific resolution as far as next steps. But I think this might help inform kind of where we can maybe be the instigator to start kind of identifying some other partners in state to bring into uh, developing um, a background paper or some kind of a policy position or something to try to start moving forward. Next month, I think it is, we've got a meeting, John and I have a meeting with other regional planning entities, transportation entities uh, across the Western states in Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and a couple others, I think. Um, and this comes up pretty much every time in conversation when we have our occasional um, get togethers that we're all in the same boat and some are in non attainment already, but um, happy to elevate that with this group as well, because I think at some point it's going to require a willingness among our federal delegation elected delegation to want to really lean into this um, so we can uh, maybe lay the groundwork in this uh, in our next conversation um, next month. But uh, it, this is part of the reason why we wanted to bring this to you is, um, you know, we've been kind of living this and it's this has been a real head scratcher as far as how we move forward. Um, so this, I think, is good direction. So we will we'll keep the board informed and uh, start fleshing out some some next steps. OK, so if anybody has any information, studies, mm -hmm. forward it to you. Yes, for sure. And, and then maybe in April, you'll report back to us on yeah. if, since you've had these other meetings. Yeah, Dean and I will put our heads together and uh, yeah. Right. And I just want to point out that this would uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I w would point out, I mean, we're working really hard to get individual meetings with uh, congressmen, senators, with PPC, PPACG, this would seem to be a good time to groove that information directly with senators' offices, should we meet with them, uh, and with the congressmen's offices as well. I mean, uh, 
yeah. as rather than barking from the outside, let's get our stuff together and and just hand it to them and go over it with them. Um, Councilwoman Hinchin. Uh, yeah, I, I'm certainly very supportive of uh, putting forth this position and making sure that um, the data that we're using is equitable and, and all of that. I'm very supportive of that. I would encourage as we put that together and as we create our position statements that we don't lose sight of the actions that we are taking to address ozone and greenhouse gases. We don't want to lose um, by pounding the table uh, a voice that says we we do care about our air quality and this is what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vanderworth. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, Council Member Hensham's uh, comments on that. For those of you that may not know, and you could certainly elaborate further on this, but um, it, we're a few years away, I think, from, uh, or any city council member here could elaborate on it. We're a few years away from, say, the Nixon power plant, the coal generation plant closing down and then burning natural gas. That'll be a gigantic change. But the fear I have is that even in doing all of this stuff, while we'll be able to take credit for it and so forth, that, that will be helpful, it's not actually going to change the ozone picture by very much because already the the locally generated ozone is such a small percentage of the total number that maybe we get a benefit of a point or two if we even get that um one other thing that i wanted to also mention to you is that uh because i do sit on the colorado state board of health and they're the ones that actually manage uh, or, 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 or monitor air quality we actually had an opportunity to take a tour of one of their air quality monitoring stations uh, in Denver it was very interesting. Uh, they they do monitor, um, I don't know, six or eight different types of air quality, different types of pollutants. And the interesting thing was uh, a, a kind of slightly different uh, twist to this. They're certainly concerned about ozone in the state, but on everything else that they monitor, uh, the pollutant levels in Colorado are so low, uh, like five or ten percent of the EPA requirement, that they're actually considering discontinuing the funding to monitor any of the other pollutants, because year after year, decade after decade, they just get the same ridiculously low number that isn't even close, and it's really kind of a waste of money. I just want to bring that point up because for any of the other pollutants that people may think about from time to time, the numbers are so low that the state is actually considering not even monitoring it anymore, just for your awareness. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other comments from anybody in the room or online? I, I would just like to make one statement. I find it fascinating that we had a year in 2020 where most oh, there was a lot of people not driving and going anywhere, right? Because of COVID and, and that to me would, be a year we could take and study and really see this is where it is this year and then this is where it isn't or it is and if anything has significantly changed that's going to really show the accurate of the background levels that we have in this area so if we're not including that in some of the study um in the updates i, I think we'll <laughs> see you. how we can uh, you know it's kind of yeah. kind of not using a once in a lifetime amount of data that we might potentially have right in our right in our hands Right. The problem with 2020 is I think we got swamped by a horrible wildfire season. I know. Yeah. And, and, I know. And yeah. I, yeah, it's it, like it gets funny too, but on the other hand, they're supposed to be different types of air. It's what you keep telling us, right? Different kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. I, I will say to that point that, that the state air pollution control division did look at um, uh, it, vehicle miles traveled, you know, that kind of transportation during that initial lockdown. And during that initial lockdown, yes, it went way down um, and, and it gave us some ideas of what was going on. Um, but then after those initial two months, what we saw is that people were um, going stir crazy at home and then going out and driving almost more. Um, so it, it they, it's kind of hard to compare. They were area up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah overwhelming her okay all right thank you all right thank you so much all right we're going to move on to item b uh pp triple a carryover funding update mr barker 
Good morning again, Jody Barker, your Area Agency on Aging Director. Uh, this, uh, this information item is really just the promise that we made uh, last month when we asked for your contingency vote to allow us to continue moving forward in the carryover uh, distribution process. Uh, this is the promised uh, report out um, of the funding. So just a couple of highlights. Uh, we received 1.122 million in uh, federal carryover funding um, after indirect uh, that uh, calculates to $852,259.23. Um, we put out a call to all of our current contracted providers uh, who are the eligible recipients of those funds. Um, of the 21 providers we currently contract with, we had 10 who applied uh, for these funds. Uh, upon review of their current spin down, their needs assessments, um, and some other points, um, we did draw away. Uh, you'll see in the one, two, three, the fourth column uh, that we did draw away uh, some of the uh, capital requests because those are eligible under some uh, upcoming ARPA funding. Uh, so we recommended that those be drawn away. Uh, and then we took the final total and because all of these uh, requests were valid. Um, they did show appropriate spin down in those areas uh, or above uh, what was uh, what would have been appropriate at that six month level. Um, we then did an equitable reduction across all of the requests of 24.2% to come to the final distribution number of $851,024.94. Jared, I'm loving this screen. Thank you. Um, and so uh, that is is the distribution that we have done. We have completed uh, the contract amendments and these funds are now available for our providers to access effective January 1. Are there any questions about uh, the distribution, the process, anything like that that I might answer? Okay, any questions from anyone online or in the room? This is not an action item, it's just Correct. a question, so we're not voting. Yes, thank you. Okay, seeing none, looks like you're up next for item C, update on AAA four-year plan. Yes, ma'am. So uh, as we mentioned uh, in an information item last, uh, last month, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are currently in the process of producing our four-year area plan under the Old Americans Act. Um, area agencies on aging across the nation are required to develop an area plan just translate that to strategic plan, uh, an area plan every four years. Uh, we're currently in that process, and that helps us to identify priorities and projects that we might need to look at uh, over the course of the coming four year period. We do use it, uh, at the four year plan, as our strategic plan. Uh, we actually uh, don't just put that on the shelf, as it were. Uh, we have a, uh, a subcommittee of the Regional Advisory Council uh, who reviews the uh, area plan with us every quarter. So we sit down and we talk about projects, we talk about updates, we talk about challenges, priorities, and that kind of thing. We also take the priorities from that and build those into our PPACG priorities. And so those become a part of our work plan. So it's all inclusive and it's a, it's a full circle of information. It also, uh, this four-year plan gets compiled with the other 15 area agencies on aging across the state of Colorado and becomes part of the state unit on aging's area plan. Uh, and then that goes to uh, that goes to uh, the legislators uh, for ultimate uh, reevaluation of our aging funding. And so it is a full circle of information. A couple of things I want to highlight um, in this area plan. Uh, we are required, uh, the minimum requirement is to do three community conversations. And that's where we go out to communities across our region to ask questions of constituents in those areas. The three, is the minimum requirement. Uh, we did eight. We did two in each park and Teller counties, and we did four in El Paso County and all across the region. Uh, in addition, we've held 13 
additional meetings of our subcommittee um, and 11 meetings. By the time uh, we get to the end, we will have held 11 internal meetings, uh, including uh, some of those volunteers from Regional Advisory Council, but also looking, working with our staff in key program areas to, uh, to develop part of this planning. So it's been an all-inclusive part of the process. I'm really pleased to share with you that every one of our Regional Advisory Council members per have participated in many of those meetings, uh, if not all of them. Um, it has been an all hands on deck um, opportunity that we have never experienced before with AAA. And I'm really pleased to be able to share that. Um, almost every member of our staff have played a role in the input and conversations and needs, um, but also every single one of our regional advisory council members. Uh, we had folks coming from Colorado Springs and joining us in Divide, joining us in Cripple Creek, joining us in Bailey, joining us in Fair Play. Um, and so just really pleased at the participation that we've had between staff and volunteers this year. So um, that is in process. Uh, we will take it to our Regional Advisory Council uh, later this month uh, for review. Uh, any final uh, uh, final recommendations uh, will be, we will make those adjustments and then we'll bring it before you in March uh, because it does have to go to the State Unit on Aging by the end of March. Um, we are not required to have any kind of letter of approval or, or anything like that, uh, but we are asking that we may do one. I will have that prepared and ready for signature um, so that we can include that uh, to, to show the support of uh, you as our board of directors. And we certainly appreciate that. So that's in process. Thank you so much. It's a lot of work. You're very welcome. Uh, you. Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Gardine. I want to personally tell you thank you for coming out and to our region out there and uh, help organize all of the, we had a Bunch of people with sporadic thought, but uh, Jody's able to come out there and get people right on the right track so we can start developing a positive plan. So I just want to tell you thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Love to hear that feedback. Uh, anyone online? Or oh, Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, um, I also noticed in the, uh, in the notes, uh, you know, in our record here, uh, the Colorado Association of Area Agencies on Aging which I don't know how I missed no, not knowing that there is a Colorado association for this and that there are several area agencies on aging in the state of Colorado. So I just have kind of a friendly suggestion. It might be kind of fun is maybe to invite whoever the ED is for that association, maybe to come down here and give a presentation to this board sometime this year, okay. no rush, and give us an update on what is transpiring in this space at a statewide level, say, for example, I don't even know how many area agencies on aging there are in the state of Colorado. There are 16 of us. Well, you see, I yes, just sir. learned something right there. <laughs> so um, I think it'd be kind of cool to have that person come down here and just give us a, a one shot update and give us a statewide picture of the whole Sure, Effort. sure. Uh, the beauty of the of the C4A, the Colorado Association of Area Agencies on Aging, is that we can we can uh, do idea shares. Uh, we talk about the challenges. We talk about our funding. We're all uh, made up just a little bit different. Most of us are Council of Governments. Several of us are part of county structure, and then there are three a complete separate 501c3 nonprofits operating under the same funding and. Uh, requirements across the state and some are purely rural, deeply rural, <laughs> and some are right there with Dr. Cog. So, um, you know, it is uh, it is a great opportunity for us to um, to grow within our programs, share ideas with each other, and then also have a common voice to the state unit as well as our national association, which is called U.S. Aging. And so to have those common voices instead of just me as the Pikes Peak region going to to uh, to presentations um, as a common voice. We can work on things together that are uh, much more effective. Yeah, and I just learned a second thing that there's a national agency. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are very busy people. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, 
there should, we should just always assume, at least maybe I should just always assume there's always an association for everything, but that wouldn't even, that would even be interesting. Maybe a little bit of information about how this is addressed at a nationwide level. I'll just propose this and hopefully maybe people consider it a good suggestion. I'd love to kind of hear kind of how the state is doing and maybe even a little bit about at national. Thank yes, you. sir. There are a lot of great opportunities presented through that. In fact, in April, I will be in Washington, D.C. at the aging policy briefing that is put on by U.S. Aging. Um, and again, several uh, area agency on, agencies on aging within Colorado are putting our efforts together to uh, to meet in person with our, our uh, federal legislation. So a lot of work going on. Sorry. And that reminds me as well, because I think we've talked about this before. It would be good for us as we get dialed in and we're understanding what the national priorities are of all the AAAs to feed that back to you all when you're back in Washington, D.C. on a more regular basis and can carry those messages back to our, our federal delegations who are all singing off the same sheet of music. So good, really good feedback. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, this a little off subject, but uh, do you know how the JAWS program with El Paso County is going forward? Because I haven't seen any reports from them. I, I haven't heard days, anything though. since our meeting, the, the meeting that you and I had out there okay. uh, a couple months ago. No. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, could you follow up with him on that, maybe? Yes. Offline? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is there any comments online having anything to do with items uh, C? Any comments from anybody in the audience? Stan, your mic is still on. Did you have another comment? Commissioner Vanderworth, your mic is still on. Did you have another comment? No, I'm good. I'm sorry. I'll turn oh, that off. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, that's kind of my cue. <laughs> All right, thank you. All righty. Okay, seeing no other comments online or in the room, we'll move on to item D. Thank Pavement you. condition and system performance targets setting with CDOT, Danelle Miller. Thank you, um, Jody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dem Danelle Miller. I'm a transportation planner here at PPACG. Uh, today, we actually have a presentation from uh, two gentlemen from CDOT, uh, Jacob Kirshner and uh, William Johnson, and they're going to talk a little bit about um, target setting and specifically the infrastructure performance and system performance uh, targets that the state have sent. Uh, and just for your information, today is, is an information item. Next month, we will bring this item back for um, supporting the state targets. Uh, as, as the MPO, we are uh, required to either support the state targets or set our own. And our um, staff recommendation uh, at this point is is uh, to support those. Um, Jacob or uh, William, if you'd like to take control and, and go ahead and um, present your slides, that would be wonderful. Yeah, and I'm going to ask again if we can just kind of hold comments and questions till the end because they might be answered by the end. Thanks for the introduction, Danielle. Uh, good morning. My name is Jacob Kirshner, and I'm the Performance Data Manager at CDOT. Today, I'm going to cover CDOT's PM2 and PM3 targets for the national performance measures. Uh, next slide, please. The national performance measures focus on the nation's transportation performance management efforts. The MAP 21 and FAST Act require that state DOTs and MPOs set targets for and report on the progress of national performance measures. State DOTs are responsible for setting two and four year data informed targets, while MPOs are only required to establish four year targets. The measures focus on three key goal areas that's safety, infrastructure condition, and system performance. Today, we are going to focus on infrastructure condition and system performance targets, which were brought as informational items in previous TAC meetings. Next slide, please. So I'm going to keep this at a pretty high overview of how we establish targets and what the established targets are. Uh, starting with infrastructure conditions, CDOT established the following two and four year targets for pavement. The percentage of pavements of the interstate system in good condition, a two-year target of 45% and a four-year target of 47%. For the interstate system in poor condition, a 4% and 3.5% target. For the non-interstate national highway system in good condition, 42% and 43%. And for the non-interstate national highway system in poor condition, both a two- and four-year target of 3.5%. For bridge, 
which is the percentage of national highway system bridges by deck area classified in good condition, both a two and four year target of 36%. And for that poor condition on the national highway system, a two and four year target of 4%. Pavement and bridge targets were established using CDOT's asset investment management system, which is the department's asset model. The model can forecast future conditions using condition data and other assumptions such as deterioration, treatment cost, inflation. CDOT generates forecast based on the anticipated budgets and then vets the targets through oversight committees. The targets are then finalized by CDOT's executive director. Moving on to system performance, CDOT established the following two and four year targets. For the percent of person miles traveled on the interstate that are reliable, a two year target of 81% and a four year target of 79%. For the non interstate national highway system that is reliable, 93 and 94%. And for the truck travel time reliability index, a two and four year target of 1.46. System performance targets were established using predictive modeling, using available data from CDOT's travel demand model, NPMRDS, which is historic travel time data, and the US Census Bureau, CDOT was able to forecast future reliability. Similar to bridge and pavement, targets were vetted by an oversight committee and then finalized by CDOT's executive director. CDOT established PM2 and PM3 targets October 1st of 2022, MPOs have 180 days from October 1st to establish four-year targets for PM2 and PM3. Therefore, MPOs must either establish their own or support the state's four-year targets by March 30th, 2023. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. I have some contact information on here. If you have any future questions, uh, are there any questions that I can address right now? Are there any questions, um, Mayor Graham? I'm, I'm sorry. Dixon. Dixon. <laughs> yeah, Mayor Dixon here. Um, is there any correlation between, or do you have any data showing the, the cost associated with trying to achieve the targets? Oh, uh, we do. So within our asset investment management model, we set a higher than, a lower than, and what our expected budget is. So we can have an understand on what our return of investment would be. And so we we have the understanding that with limited funding, uh, we do try to keep our good and fair bridges in that condition because it is more expensive when you start to repair poor bridges. So we do have an understanding of what we can get of a return on a higher than investment in our asset investment model, in our asset investment management model. But we do have to work within the budget constraints that we have at CDOT. Is there information that could be shared with this group? Um, Yes, I believe so. William William might have more information on this. He's the performance and asset management branch manager, and he's on the call right now. Hey, how's it going? Um, sorry, I don't have my camera on. I'm having a little bit of bandwidth issues. When it comes to the infrastructure condition targets that you're seeing there, all of that information detailing, you know, how we're going to achieve those targets, specifically with pavement and bridge. Uh, the cost over not just a two and four year time period, but also a 10 year period is in our new transportation asset management plan. We're still awaiting federal certification on that, but I, I can probably send a, uh, a couple of snapshots over uh, to PPACG staff for them to share with you. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to add though is those system performance targets that you see there. A lot of stuff deals with travel time. That is a little bit more difficult. Uh, I, I should change that. That is a lot more difficult to sort of forecast how much money it's going to take to achieve those. We do have a good sense of what historical information is as well as historical investment. And we're able to make some loose correlations. And I, I believe the targets that we set there were set with fiscal constraint in mind. If if you he sent yeah. that over and we can get that distributed. Yeah, that I, I uh, absolutely. I'd like to see it. But. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody online? I don't want to miss people online accidentally. Do you see any hands online? No hands online. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Vanderworth, and then and then uh, Councilmember Donaldson. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so just a uh, heads up, and it was 
related to the previous topic uh, about going to D.C. and talking to our legislators and those kinds of things, I actually will be in D.C. starting on Friday, going to the National Association of Counties Legislative Convention. I'll be there through Wednesday. Uh, one of the meetings that we actually have set up is to meet with the Federal Highway Administration. And for those of you that may not remember, uh, the former CDOT director, Shailen Bott, uh, is now the director of the Federal Highways Administration. So we're going there to talk to FHA about collaborating on innovation. There's a lot of innovative things we're doing in El Paso County to try to stretch our taxpayer dollars to do more road work. And I can tell you in the six years that um, I've been a commissioner in El Paso County, we have grown our ability to reach out and touch a gravel or paved road, either by repaving it or repairing it or uh, putting mag chloride on it or salting it or whatever. We've increased that uh, from a 200 miles per year to 500 miles per year in the last six years. And a lot of that is because of innovative approaches. So we want to go talk to FHA about innovation. And that now comes back to these statistics. It's great to have these statistics, but you know, it, it seems to me like the two top requirements for a road are safety and efficiency. Do they efficiently deliver people to where they need to go? And um, obviously an infrastructure condition is an indicator, you know, if it's in a better a road in better shape, you would assume you get better efficiency and you get better safety out of it. But the question I have is, what kind of data do we have that actually correlates those two? Like, do you really get any improvement between a good and a fair road or do you, uh, you know, like, so these are about condition, but I don't really know how these translate to what I think are the two most important requirements for why you even have a road. So how, how do we correlate this to, to those requirements? Um, J Jacob, I, I'm, I'm going to take this one here. I think one one performance measure. So there's the, you're seeing PM two and PM three. Uh, so naturally, it's there is a PM one, and that deals with safety. And uh, I'm I'm not sure on your staff uh, if somebody has the answer to when that appeared before the board. We're actually required to, as the state, establish safety targets annually, and it's based off of five year rolling average. So that, that's sort of just this continuous activity where we're going through and refining what our, our safety performance target is, as well as the strategies that we're using to, in an attempt to achieve zero fatalities on our system. I think when you're, you're talking about efficiency, the closest thing that you see to that is that PM3. Uh, you know, it, it is travel time reliability, and in some sense, it's the proxy for congestion. And with that, it's really a measurement of how efficiently vehicles are moving across the road. Speaking to correlation, uh, it is possible to statistically correlate assets in a state of good repair with travel time. I think, it, you know, anecdotally, you know, when there's a pothole in the road, the, tra the travel time will drop. And I, I think that, you know, if there's a large number of vehicles and if there's a like mainline break or a sinkhole, you'll, you'll see the travel times drop. We don't necessarily view that or report that information in real time. Everything that we report is based on that full calendar year or the performance period year that we're looking at. And it, needless to say, and, and we like to think that we react quickly to these things and it does get sort of washed out in the data. I'm not sure if I'm really giving you a, a direct response, more so that we do have a safety performance uh, measure and, and target and system performance is that one that is more closely aligned to efficiency. I would also add, add that this is a requirement. Uh, this, this is coming as an edict from the Fed. So all DOTs, not just CDOT, have to do this. Uh, and I think um, uh, there was you, uh, Commissioner Donaldson, um, CDOT does have a policy director directive called PD14, which is our transportation's commission's uh, policy directive, roughly on performance measures. And then that there are some additional performance measures that serve as a, a complementary extension to these things that we have from the feds. Am I getting getting close to giving you a, an acceptable response there? No, thank you. I, I think uh, there was a 
some comments that you made that that make the statement about that there is a correlation. For example, I appreciate you specifically stated there is a correlation between um, efficiency and road condition. So that's good to know. Um, I, I just um, I just always feel like the requirements that should always be measured and looked at is uh, efficiency and safety. So, you know, when we have these requirements, OK, so it's a federal mandate to measure these, and I'm sure they're trying they're working on the assumption that these connect to those. But it always feels like those are the two things we should always be looking at. Efficiency and safety. And I think, Madam Chair, did we do safety last month to know the board adopted? We did. Yeah. Um, we uh, supported the state target last month and had a presentation the previous month. Right. And uh, Council Member Donaldson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And this will be for the gentleman online. What's is it, Jacob? Jacob, it looks like uh, the two year targets in 2023, it's now 45% for the first uh, the first mm -hmm. item on there, percentage of pavements on the interstate system in good condition. But this is a true up, correct? Do you understand? Like, I think we set these in 2021 uh, originally. Is that correct? And that's why the two year target was in 23. Uh, so the performance time period begins for this in 2022. So we're already one year into the performance period for this. So we did establish these targets throughout October or throughout 2022. Actually, it is using available 2021 data, though. OK, so it's based on it. It's a little confusing because it's 2023 now. This is our two year target. But uh, we're already there, so it's not really a two year target. It's uh, unless I'm just being confused. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah, um, if I if I can add and apologies for for getting the previous speakers title incorrect. Uh, I think that what we're looking at is the, the performance evaluation period starts in January of 2022 and runs through the end of December of 2023. So it's an evaluation of a full calendar year. So okay. we're, we're, we're sort of at the start of the middle of the middle. Very good. And so this is just the original goal is 45% on that first thing we're going to measure, yes. uh, correct? OK, yes. so nothing has been adjusted yet. So that took care of my question. Thank you. Is there any questions for anybody online? And I'm not seeing any other microphones on in the room. Is there any last chance for comments or questions? OK, so if you think of any comments or questions after the meeting, Danelle would be your person to contact about any further information. All right, thank you very much. That takes us on to item E, legislative update, John Leosatos. And Jody? OK. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, so for those of you who are, are new to the board, um, we have a, a legislative committee that uh, uh, during the session meets on a monthly basis towards the beginning. And then as we get towards uh, the end, when they start throwing the unfunded mandates around, uh, we'll move to uh, a once every two weeks. And then <laughs> right in the thick of it, we'll probably meet uh, uh, weekly towards the end. Um, we do have a, a lobbyist that is uh, paid with non-grant funds, uh, Dan Jablan, uh, and uh, he has uh, worked out a, a deal to get assistance from um, um, Ali, something Ann, what is it, Suzanne? Suzanne. Uh, oh, Suzanne. Suzanne, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, that provides sort of the framework. Uh, last year, our, our chairs were uh, Commissioner Elsner and uh, Mayor Thompson, uh, due to time constraints, they've sort of uh, stepped away. So our new chair is uh, Commissioner Stone, and we believe that at the next meeting, uh, Mayor Dixon will be confirmed as the other co-chair. So, but they haven't voted yet, so I can't call you that yet. Um, currently, we're on today is day 27 of uh, day of 120 day session. Um, we are all set. Um, as our uh, legislative committee to visit the Capitol on March 2nd. 
And so it, it, that would be open to all of our uh, board members uh, if they're willing to go. I think at this point we're going to uh, talk about it more at our, our February 12th meeting, but it looks like we're going to do sort of a caravan. So those folks who are in uh, maybe uh, uh, Park Kearney can start getting people together and stop and tell her, and then we'll all meet down here and, and we'll be as efficient as we can of, of getting folks up to the Capitol. Um, as far as the, the, the um, session itself, uh, the legislators had their bill titles by had had dropped their bill titles by last Wednesday. So from now on, anything that would be dropped would be considered a late bill and would need the permission of the majority leadership uh, to get filed. So kind of what's been filed is what's been filed. Um, in Arizona, we used to call them strikers. I don't know what you call them here, but you look for those substitute bills. Um, a little over 300 bills have been dropped um, so far this session, and we are currently tracking 50 through our legislative process, um, a little less actually. Um, we will call that down. So on our meeting um, on the 12th, we will look at, we won't have time to look at all 50 bills, but we will look at the ones that we think um, have the most merit. So we'll probably work with you, Commissioner Stone and Mayor Dixon to say, you know, what, which ones do you want to start with? And then we'll kind of go from there. But if you do have any bills that you're personally tracking and think are um, within the PPACG wheelhouse or as a regional issue, uh, feel free to let us know and we'll make sure that that um, kind of gets on our radar screen. Um, normally when we have these legislative updates, so in the future, we'll actually get up and talk about actual bills instead of sort of this is it, but we ha since we haven't met yet, this is more of sort of priming the pump and letting you know about the process. Feel free to get involved in the process, uh, that legislative committee, because they do go for an hour, sometimes an hour and a half talking about bills, and it would be um, not the best use of everyone's time if we then come here to the board and have another hour and a half discussion. So if you're interested in these sorts of things, uh, we would encourage you to participate in that discussion so we don't have to have the discussion twice. Um, and then wrapping up um, of those 50 bills that we're currently looking at for PPACG, um, seven of them relate to our veteran population. Um, and there are 12 bills on environment to, and on the, on the environment, on air quality control, as well as two rent control bills. So we'll be looking at those um, on the 12th and seeing if we can call those down and decide which ones um, we want to have discussions about. Um, Senate Bill 23107, uh, Senior and Veterans Tax Exemption, uh, will be going to committee tomorrow. And I think Jody's going to testify on that and he's going to let you know um, how you can participate that if you uh, would be so interested in what he's going to sort of chat about. Now, so this is one, as you may recall, this came uh, before committee last year and uh, was defeated. But Senators uh, Liston and Janal have brought that back and they're continuing to look for uh, additional uh, sponsors uh, from the House on that. Um, this is an adjustment of last year's bill. Um, they have changed some of the language in it to include medical necessity uh, for that portability instead of portability by choice. Um, and so they have uh, included language in the uh, this new bill 107 uh, to represent that medical necessity and how to access that. Uh, they've also changed their request uh, of last year instead of an immediate flat increase on the property taxation amount. Uh, they have approached they're approaching that this time in a uh, in a phased system, and so it'll increase uh, effective January one if passed, uh, and then step up again after January one of 2028. And so uh, we'll be uh, like uh, John mentioned, I'll be uh, testifying again uh, with that. We have put out the word to a variety of uh, partners, including C4A, a Colorado Association of Area Agencies on Aging, uh, to see if they may have someone available as well. Uh, we've also reached out to our Regional Advisory Council members, as well as our Colorado, or excuse me, our Pikes Peak uh, Commission on Aging members uh, to see if they might be available to testify as well to increase that. That was one thing I noticed last year. There were a lot of uh, senior service providers 
providers. There were a lot of uh, tax staff there supporting the bill, but there were no actual constituents, no stakeholders specific to that age group that would be affected. And so we've done a little bit extra legwork this time around to see if we can get uh, over 65 uh, age group to participate in this um, testifying. So that's what I have. That'll be tomorrow afternoon. I'll, I will be testifying this time uh, via Zoom due to uh, a variety of other uh, things going on tomorrow afternoon. So we'll bring back uh, an update to you. All right. Thank you. Co-Chair Stone. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of things that are actually this week things that people should probably uh, be aware of. Um, Senate Bill 23059, which is titled State Parks and Wildlife Area Local Access Funding, uh, goes to committee tomorrow. Uh, I will be up there. I'm assuming uh, Park County will be up there in force also because they authored this bill. Uh, essentially, what this bill does is takes the a portion of the excess of the Keep Colorado Wild fee that now appears on your vehicle registration and allocates that into a grant program for counties and local governments to use uh, for the maintenance of roads leading to state parks and wildlife areas. As those of us who manage those roads know, and, and specifically Park County has a tremendous burden, uh, is that when the pandemic came and the governor finally did come out and say, yes, you can go out, but go to the mountains, um, go to our state parks. Uh, I know Park County on the road that leads to 11 Mile State Park, uh, the traffic has now increased to over 450,000 cars a year on those roads and uh, Park County has roughly the same road budget as Teller County, but with three times the miles of roads to maintain. And in short, they need help, but there's a lot of counties that need help. And uh, we anticipate because of this additional fee and people begin to learn, hey, I can get into state parks for free because they already paid for it, um, is that they're going to continue to increase uh, in numbers going to state parks. Uh, what we're asking, it was uh, projected, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Commissioner Elsner, but about 37 million, I believe, or 34 million was the projected revenue from this bill when it went through. Um, and that was based upon a 30% participation rate. In other words, a 70% opt-out rate. Uh, we believe it probably is going to be reversed uh, on that. We think it's likely going to be a 30% opt-out rate or maybe even lower than that. And instead of raising $34 million, they're likely to raise closer to $70 million. And what we're asking is for the legislature to take a small percentage of what is over the projected revenue adjusted for inflation and uh, put it into a grant program for counties to be able to help maintain roads. This has not been well accepted by DNR um, for reasons which you could probably understand as they're looking at a, you know, at a wonderful pot of money that they've never had in their history. Uh, and so they're very excited to have that money or not really interested in sharing it. Uh, but we believe and it's our intent that uh, state parks, state wildlife areas is an experience that starts from the moment that you leave your home whether it's going on uh, you know, local roads leaving Colorado Springs, but then to other counties, the county road leading to that, to that state park is all part of that experience because uh, the average driver doesn't know at what point they're on a state highway versus they're on a local road, county road, and what's a state park road. So uh, we're asking for support on this. Uh, again, I'll be up there. I know that Park County will be up there uh, as well. But it's something that if, if you wanted to pull up uh, and look at that committee uh, and write a letter on it, you know, and, and pop them an email and explain your local situations, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, reaching state parks, whether it's in your county or nearby your cities and or even places that you know that your citizens are going to. I mean, for here in Colorado Springs, the, the most highly used state park within within close proximity here is Cheyenne Mountain State Park. And I know a part of that road, uh, you know, is maintained, I believe, by the county, isn't it, Stan? Um, the road into Cheyenne Mountain State Park, that's maintained by the county, I believe. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and in uh, Mueller State Park in, in Teller County, it's off of a state highway. It's not an issue there, but we do have a state wildlife area. But uh, that doesn't change the situation, though, in other places like Park County. So that's an important bill. Uh, another one that will also 
will be coming up, but I believe it's going to be delayed. It was supposed to be in committee tomorrow, but it's Senate Bill 23108, which is allowing temporary reductions in property tax due. Uh, this was something actually that we, that we offered, authored in Teller County so that detabored local governments, it clarifies the authority of the local government to tempor temporarily lower the mill levy or offer uh, the real estate tax credits for the purposes of tax relief. Currently, the statutes are actually silent on it. All it says is that for Tabor refunds, you follow this, you know, this this process in order to do so. But if you're detabored, it actually gets into conflict with Tabor because Tabor specifically says that if the, the mill levy increases from the previous period, that must be voted on by the public. And while that certainly would be an increase if we temporarily lowered it, that would be an increase. So what this this is attempting to do, and we think we're going to get some bipartisan support on this, is allow local governments uh, and clarifies their authority to temporarily lower the mill levy uh, for a period of for a short period of time, and then restore to a level which had already been voted on by uh, by the public. Uh, and when we say local government, of course, this reaches all the way to a library district uh, or anybody else and just gives more local control. And in a situation where, as we all look forward to 2024, where we realize that there are going to be real estate uh, valuation increases that are spiking at a significant level, it just gives us authority for local governments to say, you know what, we're good. Um, or we'll be good if we only do this much, so we're going to lower it by this much. Um, it just clarifies that authority. So uh, again, I think that's going to be delayed in committee now, but uh, we'll we'll report back on that one. And th those are the two that I just wanted to really highlight. Uh, I don't know if anybody else on the committee has okay. any uh, other specific bills that that they want to just report back to the group on. Yeah, real quickly, um, there was a bill that came to our attention in Cripple Creek, and it, it really impacts the rural communities more than anything, and it's House Bill uh, 23032. Um, it, it, um, it requires or it now allows businesses that are not, do not have a physical address within your municipality to no longer need to pay a business license within your, your city. Um, that's a significant hit to us, especially with our casino industry. Uh, in our mining industry, we've got a lot of businesses that operate in Cripple Creek, but are not located there. Uh, so that's a bill we want to try to keep our eye on as well for the rural communities, especially uh, bigger our bigger uh, urban areas. Uh, obviously, a lot of those businesses are operating out of those those areas already. So that's just a bill we we need to keep our eye on. Could you repeat the number? Yes. It's Excuse me. It's House Bill uh, um, twenty three. Dash zero three two. Traditionally, uh, bills with three numbers are Senate Sorry. bills. So four numbers, four numbers. Yeah, that may be. Sorry about that. That's that may okay. be a Senate bill. Yeah. So four numbers is a House bill. Yep. Three numbers is Sorry a Senate bill. Yep. No, it's okay. So it took me a while to figure that one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Did okay. Twenty three zero three two. Yeah. Yeah, that's not it. Nope. That's a House bill he's got pulled up. He's got 1032 pulled up. He wants zero. Oh, my bad. That you, my bad. That is that is 22032. It's a bill that was poorly written. So we've got our attorneys looking at that got it. Um, because it does not. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's just so poorly written. Nobody understands how to apply it. So okay. that's something we're, we're looking at uh, legal action on. OK. And. Uh, City of Fountain, uh, I know it has nothing to do with PPACG, but we actually um, passed an ordinance that we are not collecting the pit, the uh, plastic bag fee. This it's between the customer and the store. Up doing what? So, uh, Commissioner Elsner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if you want to testify, you don't have to go to Denver. If you go to the website, uh, legislature, there's a deal that's a how to testify. And you have an option of remote testimony, written testimony, testify in person or listen online. If you do the first one, it'll send you everything you need to be able to to get in and, and testify. You just need to make sure you know what committee you want to testify at um, so you can get that done. And as far as the uh, the tax one, 
being able to lower your uh, mill levy temporarily and put it back up there, um, that's really important for everybody that has debruced. The issue between this is, um, you know, Park County, we haven't debruced. We have a mill levy of um, almost 25 that we could charge, but because we haven't debruced, we have to give a temporary tax credit every year. And it gets this year, I think we're down somewhere around 20 mills. Um, as it goes up, if our property values go up a lot, the mill levy is going to go down. It's kind of the way we stay within Tabor. But if the uh, market should crater and everything goes down, we have that little bit of adjustment that we can do. But this is kind of providing other uh, counties that have debruced that same ability. And I would recommend that everybody pay attention to what the legislature is doing, get in on the legislative meetings. They're very important to us. Uh, I would be there, but I have the the pleasure of going to the uh, Colorado Water Congress State Affairs meeting every Monday at nine o'clock or eight o'clock till nine, nine thirty to talk legislation. Um, ours is more fun than theirs is, but but I would really encourage everybody to go. And let me make sure there's nobody online first. Anybody online? Okay, Commissioner Vandworth. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm uh, missing something or failing to just see it, but you know we have our legislative committee, and I'm getting you know the invites for the legislative committee, and I'm getting the Dan Jablan uh, kind of legislative update announcements. But I don't think I've received anything about proposed positions from our legislative committee on any bills. I don't see anything. I, I just checked my email and sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Commissioner Vanderbilt, they, they have met yet. As I had stated earlier, they meet on the 12th. And so after they meet on the 12th, we'll have some positions to bring back to you. OK, so I thought was... I saw some invites already for this year that. I guess maybe they met and didn't take positions on anything. Then? Yeah, they were when they had met previously. Uh, it was before the session had started, and there it's was more no of organizational. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So, so, we just so I'm not missing anything. No, no, we just decided to wait until uh, several bills had dropped. Uh, didn't make sense to be meeting, taking the time to meet for an hour or ninety minutes if there's only two bills to discuss. So we just decided to wait until we have more more to discuss. OK, so um, maybe someone could just tell me when can we expect the first set of recommendations from the legislative committee and what's our timing for voting on it and and all of that? It'll be coming out after next Monday's meeting. Um, yeah, Monday the 13th when the committee meets. I think we've got a handful of bills that the committee needs to dig into. Um, yeah, and we'll share that out then with the full board. Right. OK, yeah. thank you. That explains that. If I may, Madam Chair. Yeah, and if you're interested in getting on that email loop you, um, and you can't attend the meeting, uh, you will have a link to the bills we're discussing, and you are more than welcome to email any of the committee members with your position or what you want to see discussed and let them know. Uh, make different points because that's our strength is everybody coming at it from a different point, point of view, and uh, we really need that input. And Eric Stone? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, for those who have been through legislative sessions before, um, you know, you'll know how difficult it is for us as an organization to react in, a, you know, in a holistic way uh, because we're holding our meeting on the 12th. Obviously, they just started the legislative session a, a couple of weeks ago. The very first uh, committee meetings are actually beginning to happen about right now uh, as these things move forward. But uh, as we come forward with recommendations and all uh, as as a committee, we'll work with John and with Andy, if there's anything which we feel that we need to take a position on quickly because of the speed at which the legislature is moving, uh, then we'll get with Andy and see about calling a special meeting on Zoom or something uh, or figuring out a way in order to take a position in a timely manner. Um, I know with, with CCI and I'm sure with CML as well, it's it's sometimes just really, really hard to to get the whole organization to be able to hear be educated and then react. Um, and I would say also with this legislature, and I don't, maybe it's this way at the start of every legislative session, but uh, the uneducated position of sponsors of bills is alarming to me. Um, and it's, and what I mean by that is 
good legislation, and I know because we all do this when it comes to counties or cities, is that we gather stakeholders, you know, we we try to as much as possible educate ourselves on the issue that's in front of us before we take action, try to understand the second and third order impacts of what we're doing. Um, the committee meeting that I attended yesterday, uh, the sponsors uh, had no clue what points that the opposition was bringing up because an opposition I would call stakeholders, right? Um, if I'm opposed, it means I'm engaged. It should be somebody that would have been talked to before so that they could better craft and shape legislation in a way that's acceptable to more people. I actually saw a brand new representative who introduced the bill that I won't go into because it doesn't affect this group. Um, when somebody was testifying, a professional from the federal government uh, was testifying about this bill, was slamming her head on the dais in response to what they were saying. I'm not kidding. She was banging her head on the dais from what was being said about her bill. And uh, but she had no idea what this person was going to say because they'd never actually talked with this federal agency about the bill they were presenting. So be aware. And I'm hoping it's a steep learning curve in the legislature. I'm hoping that not only will professional behavior and decorum, uh, you know, be brought forward quickly, but it's been an it's been an odd legislative session so far from my observation, uh, but that means that we have to remain that much more engaged and and we, we have to educate as much as we can and not just by going up and banging on a desk and saying, no, this is wrong. You know, we're learning that in the new, you know, the the, the new ratio of the legislature is that if you don't get to them before the committee hearing uh, to try to shape and mold a little bit, uh, then you know, then you are literally just banging on a, you know, on, on a desk and they won't hear you. But I, and I do want to point out, though, that hearing that we went to yesterday, which was seven Democrats and four Republicans, uh, we took a large panel of people up to to educate. We actually got uh, two Democrats vote against the bill, only passed by one in the House. Kind of gives me hope, you know, that as it moves, this particular bill moves to the Senate that, you know what, we have a good case and hopefully they heard it and hopefully can get some amendments that make it more palatable. I, have, I don't harbor any hope that we can actually really stop much, but boy, we can shape a lot if we do it right and we're organized about it. Just one last thing. So we do ask when you do get the recommendations from the committee that you look at that um, and respond within 24 hours has always been our timeline. And um, if, if you wait three or four days, you're, it may not matter because we'll, we've had to move forward on the recommendation of the board and the comments that we've gotten from people. So it's really important you respond back. Um, Council Member Donaldson. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Jody, did you say that the homestead exemption bill this year is not um, proposing portability for all seniors but only for those who have a uh, medical necessity to to take it? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, last year's language was uh, was a portability for all, and that was both veterans and seniors. Um, this year, they're defining that as medical necessity only after they've um, met the initial 10-year requirement. All right, so a lot of doctors and PAs are going to have their uh, their patients uh, Yes, there's a doctor form that's that's uh, that'll be uh, developed. There will also, and that uh, that form is being developed by the state property tax administrator. So there's a lot of processing still working. Uh, hang process. on just a second, Roland. Uh, Council uh, Commissioner Vanderworth has been there, and then we'll come to you. Yes, uh, it, it maybe it's obvious to everybody, but uh, um, you know, in working with our county legislative team, we've been informed that several of the more important bills are intentionally going to be dropped in the last couple of weeks of the legislative session. Uh, notwithstanding my concern over that, it is nonetheless likely to happen. And therefore, um, this board is going to need to be ready over the last few weeks to move really fast, probably inside 24 hour time cycles. So we're just going to all have to be ready to re read those emails, respond to those emails and get get a lot of action done in a, just a couple of weeks towards the end, because if we don't do that, then, you know, we won't have an opportunity to have some influence on the bill or testify or whatever the deal is. So we're going to expect that this session. Uh, can you give me that bill number again, please, for the senior 
better than yes sir that is senate bill 23-107 thank you and i believe that goes to committee tomorrow doesn't it yeah. yes that's tomorrow afternoon yeah, yeah and i'll be up there to testify okay. on that as well great that's the so, and you're going to testify five. on zoom i'm going to be testifying okay because i'll be in person okay uh, so. advice, with the with the ph will be the new red card like the red card holders you know everybody wanting their red card you'll be getting it there but i think we work with it where we've got it we went for everything last year trying to make it portable for everybody we got smacked down uh so we come back this year and let's let's keep working at it so yeah i would just say it's, it's going to put doctors pas nurse practitioners in an awkward spot when that person you like comes to you and wants you to you know sign off on this form it's it's probably it's better it, it would be better to have passed it the way it was last year where seniors could could just uh do that now you're you know it's another it, it's going to encourage some uh you know, creative medicine, I'll say. We see a whole new industry pop up of people going to uh, doctors just to get it signed off. So if you're in a business, go for it. But uh, we're getting way out of line. Yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, unfortunately, the argument it's at the committee last year was not about the portability. It was not about the funding. It was about um, inequity to uh, renters. That was the full argument um against and so to bring this back the senators uh decided to change some of the language this year so we'll see how it goes commissioner so it's the first time i testified and boy what an experience i, I have to so, add i i have to, i have to add now being done. now it will be inequitable to healthy people yeah because you know. yeah and i do want to point out on the the medical pieces that uh one of the sick one of the main reasons that elderly people move away from Teller County, move away from Park County, is because they can no longer live at altitude. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a difference between, you know, 1,500 feet, 6,000 feet down here at the base of Pice Peak and uh, 8,500 at my place, you know, 8,000 plus at, in all of Park County. Um, so there is, there, there are very real medical reasons that people need to move. And the question is, do you want to move within Colorado or do you want them to just move away? Uh, because of many, many, and I would say most are just choosing to move away uh, just because they, they feel like, you know what, I can't take the, the property tax exemption with me. There's no reason to stay, so I'm just going to go. 30 seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, just, so just first off, I misspoke. Apparently, I, I don't know what day of the week it is. Uh, Jody did correct me. Actually, our next uh, legislative meeting is Monday the 13th. So that's OK. I, I wasn't coming on the 12th no, anyway. I, I spoke. Second thing is, and again, remember, a few months back, you did all, all pass our legislative policy positions, which, again, gives us a basis for which uh, the executive committee and uh, the executive director can move very quickly uh, on bills towards that that very uh, fast session, the, the end of the session when things get started going fast, yeah, uh, we have seconds. put that document in place and that's really sort of the the value of it. Okay, on to the next thing. Okay, you know I'm joking with you, John. Okay, alrighty, on to item F, Comprehensive Economic Development Study says Paul Rochette and Andy Gunning. Oh, well, good morning, everyone, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, commissioners. Um, I'm Paul Rochette. I'm the military planning program manager, and uh, we have a new program here at PPACG. It's a program called the Community Economic Development Strategy. It is funded by the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade and uh, from funds from the Economic Development Administration. <clears throat> ASEDS is a regional approach to economic development. Uh, it will encompass El Paso County, Park County, and Teller County and all of the communities. Um, it's going to look at economic development across a wide variety of sectors. We'll be including uh, uh, all of the communities. We'll be including for-profit firms, nonprofit firms, civic organizations, and, and local governments. Uh, utilities, uh, We'll be looking all the way from rural areas to urban areas. It's not a Colorado Springs-centric effort. 
we uh, basically the organizational structure of this is we have formed two committees. We have one which we informally call the kitchen cabinet. It's got uh, um, the formal name is the Strategic Planning Leadership Committee, and it consists of professionals in the economic development area. It's led by uh, uh, folks from uh, uh, J- uh, John uh, um, Reader Klemeyer from the uh, EDC Chamber. We've got Bob Cope from the city, Crystal Latier from the county, uh, Crystal Bailey from uh, City of Fountain, and uh, um, uh, let's see, we got Jeff here on the committee for ta- for Cripple Creek. Uh, a number of do- other people. It'll be about ten people. This committee's already met several times, and they're really going to be kind of our guidance and some of the hands-on to do some of the work. We've also developed a uh, uh, an overall stakeholders group, and the stakeholders group. Essentially, we've been recruiting them over the last several weeks, already come up to about 40 confirmed yeses, probably end up with 60 in total, but they are uh, from a wide variety of sectors, educational, healthcare, aerospace, manufacturing, um, uh, various community groups, uh, uh, just you name it, we probably have them involved. Our goal of having this effort will be to look at all of the existing economic development plans that exist in the region, whether they're uh, local government and adopted, whether they're from individual industries or businesses or interest groups, and try and pull them together, uh, review them, pull out the existing strategies and programs that they are looking at, create kind of a regional approach of how can we um, communicate between all the uh, areas so that we can better collaborate and be more effective. But we'll then, after we've uh, pulled together all of the plans that we can find, we'll go through it and we'll develop a SWOT analysis, which I think you're all familiar with the SWOT analysis. And once we've done the SWOT analysis, both at a regional level, at a community level, at a sector level, we'll begin to examine that to see Where do we have leverages between our strengths and our opportunities so we can move forward? Where do we have uh, uh, constraints from uh, uh, the threats that we have versus our strengths? Where do we have vulnerabilities from the from the uh, weaknesses that we have that match the opportunities, put it together and try and come up with a set of regional strategies Once we have the regional strategies, we're also going to be looking at a resiliency analysis to see how that fits in to the regional strategies that we have. Then adopt a series of uh, projects that are either already in the planning stages or are suggested by some of the uh, stakeholders. What kinds of projects should we follow over the next five years? establish kind of a monitoring and reporting system, and then just uh, monitor that effort over regional over the next five years. Um, The reason we're doing this, there's really two very important reasons we're doing a SEDS. The first one is we do want to make this a better community. And we do believe that by working together, hopefully we can have that synergy that's created and improve the outcomes of all the individual efforts that are being undertaken under the region. The other major reason is the Economic Development Administration will be requiring having a SEDS adopted in order to achieve, to uh, receive future funds from the Economic Development Administration. So there's that dollar carrot that's out there. There's also discussion and movement towards using uh, a SEDS as either an evaluation criteria or as a requirement from a number of other federal agencies in order to raise funding in the future. So we're really doing this uh, uh, for a large part for the future federal opportunities that we have. The project uh, officially begins, we've already had uh, several teams, several meetings of our kitchen cabinet, but our big kickoff group with the stakeholders will be on February 22nd. And we expect eh, probably a pretty good crowd, 60 to 70 folks uh, as this kickoff goes on. We have to have it done by the end of October this year. So we've got a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, uh, but uh, essentially that's what we'll be doing. And um, uh, let's see. I'm just you know going through this as quickly as I can because I know we've run out of time. So I'm trying to go rapidly, but I don't want to skip over anything that's really important. Um, but anyhow, I think you know I think that's the big picture. 
And what I'd love to do is hear any questions or comments or advice, anything that you have to say on this, because uh, uh, this is our first ever doing a SEDS. So I'll just open it up to you. Any questions online? Any question from anybody in the room? Yes, Mayor Dixon. Mayor Dixon. Mayor. Yeah. Um, what type of information would you say you'd be looking for from, say, small communities? Yes. Well, um, the the first thing that we'll really look for is, has anything already been put together on paper? And, you know, we would then uh, we staff folks go through that, try and pull that together. But then in the both in the uh, kitchen cabinet, but also in the stakeholders group, we begin bringing up various, um, I would call them trends or, or issues that we've seen. And we're planning on a lot of two-way communications, whether they're surveys, whether they're one-on-ones uh, at the locations. We plan on visiting uh, folks throughout the region. We're not going to just do it all here from our office. They might be phone calls, um, inputs, questions at some of the, we're looking at the stakeholders meetings. We're not sure how often, it, probably every other month. Uh, every month might be too much to bring people in, but uh um, we're really not sure where we're going to go, but basically the door is open to the issues that you bring forth. The, uh, attendance at yes. these meetings, do they have to be elected officials or can they no. be community representatives? They can be community representatives, elected officials. We have CEOs. We have, you know, there's just a wide variety. It's open. If I could circle back, Madam Chair, just to answer your initial question, uh, Mayor, one thing we are looking for is if you have adopted economic development plans, policies, strategies within your local community, we're trying to pull all that together as mm -hmm. an initial starting point. So if you have anything like that, whether it's in your comprehensive plan or as a separate standalone economic development strategy, uh, that would be super helpful. And then mm -hmm. just to expand on what Paul mentioned uh, briefly is that we are looking at having meetings in Teller County and Park County as well when the time is right to do a deeper mm -hmm. dive into what the needs are there and start developing uh, the, the projects that we need to mm -hmm. begin to identify in the final uh, SEDS plan. Um, so more to more to come on. on mm -hmm. those. Yeah. We're also looking at going out eastern El Paso County and include the agricultural community and the rural communities there as well. Um, Amen to that. All right. Any more questions or comments from anybody online or in the room? All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. That takes us on to item six, other reports and minutes. Most of them are in your packet as various reports, but we do have a CDOT monthly update. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members. Um, real quick for an update within CDOT headquarters, our chief engineer, Steve Harrelson, has retired. And we have a new chief engineer, Keith Stefanik, who was our deputy chief engineer at the time, has promoted up to our chief, as well as Rebecca White has retired from a uh, division of transportation development. And she is that position is currently being advertised for replacement. Um, as far as within the region, we are still looking for a planner, um, advertising for a planner um, that uh, to replace Wendy Pettit, as well as program engineers, both for the north and the south program. Uh, regarding project updates, State Highway 94, um, we expect to have our traffic signals complete within hopefully the month of March and planning on a ribbon cutting ceremony for just State Highway 94 on the MAMSEP project in April. And some more to come. I'll let you guys know when that will happen. On I-25, we are continuing to work on the northbound side and shifting that traffic closer into the median direction in, in area. Um, just as part of our construction phasing on that I-25 piece of the BAMSET project. Um, the southbound bridge has been removed as of this past month um, and continuing to work on the um, interchange at Academy and I-25. Regarding State Highway 9 and US-285, um, we had uh, awarded the project and we're expecting to begin that project early April as of right now. Um, Colorado 115 is on a winter shutdown. We're just doing minor work until probably March is when we'll start to see a lot of that work pick back up. And then the US 24 resurfacing project from Chapita Park up through Woodland Park to the west of Woodland Park. We're expecting that project to begin in April. Um, and at that time, that's the majority of my updates. Any questions for CDOT? Yes, sir. 
the uh, project men on uh, Highway 24 from Woodman Park to mm-hmm. Stapleton when when do you plan on? Yes, sir. So um, I think we discussed this back in December, if I remember correctly, maybe November. Um, I think at that time I suggested it be a calendar year 25. It'll actually be calendar year 24. Okay. And so not this summer, but the following summer, we'll have that under construction. And then uh, one other question. Uh, there's uh, three bridges in between Peyton and uh, uh, Calhan mm-hmm. that are really aging. OK, and they're made of wood and they've been getting, they've been getting smacked a lot by different vehicles. OK. Um, uh, is that part of the plan coming up to rebuild those or what? And so right now the bridges are not to be replaced. We are looking at the guardrail and the approaches as right. well as each location. That's part of our safety analysis to identify if we need to do improvements, et cetera, on those projects. So that project, if you will, is currently being designed this calendar year. And so more to come as to what that improvement will actually look like. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, barring any other questions from CDOT, I'm going to take a little break here because I did see one of our military partners, I believe, pop on. Did I see um, Colonel, I'm not sure the title, Peterson, Peterson, Space Force Command. Did I see them pop on just a second ago? They did pop in. They were in earlier, but didn't unmute at that time. Um, okay, I just want to make sure we didn't miss them if they were wanted to say something. OK, if they could just let uh, let us know and otherwise we'll keep moving forward. Um, stack. Commissioner Williams. Hi there. So we had our stack meeting last Thursday. Um, there is a new process for transportation alternatives. Um, and that was approved by the Transportation Committee. There was some pushback on that um, by both us and um the northwest tpr uh it does add in c dot staff and we felt it took away some of the power of the people who actually represent the region so we're going to keep a close eye to see how that works that's one of the sources of funding one of the many sources of funding that we have we talked about the uh, next statewide transportation plan um the long range plan which we need to start planning in july and the list of funds it's like a 10 10 to 12 acronyms that we have to go through every fund and make plans and um so we're going to uh work through that maybe have a couple of live meetings maybe in may and june um, even go the whole day so that we could work through what the funds actually do, which ones are going to be controversial, which ones are not. Because um, when we start uh, advising on the long range transportation plan, it's going to be pretty serious work. Let's see, anything else? Um, CDOT did an update on all of its 2022 accomplishments, which was really nice. And we did a winter maintenance update. And I know that Dick Elsner was there and John Leosados, and I think Dave Donaldson was there for a while too. So please yeah, add in any more comments. Okay, no comments for anybody else. Any questions for Commissioner Williams on the stack? Anything that happened there? Okay, and if you, if you go through their uh, agenda, and things beforehand, you can just send your questions to um, Commissioner Williams and she'll get you the answers. Mm-hmm. Most definitely, or send them to John too. So, John okay. Lisa's. thank you. <laughs> He's looking for the ne- other John in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. John's, John's my uh, right hand man. So, um, we, you know, he keeps me in line. There you go. All right, that takes us on to item K, the executive director's report. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of items. Um, I did notice also you've got in the packet, we kind of skipped over the committee and commission vacancies. Um, it's just in there for FYI. But actually, since we started doing that, I think uh, last month or earlier, um, we're getting some really good responses of jurisdictions identifying CAC reps and, and other representatives from your community. So uh, really appreciate uh, folks uh, helping us out there. Just a couple of things I wanted to report on. Um, one is that we had a, a really good executive committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, the chair, vice chair, second vice chair, secretary, and uh, treasurer. And you'll notice on the agenda um, some of the changes that were discussed, and we decided to 
try out like a timed agenda, trying to give times to different items to see if we can kind of get through a lot of things we have to cover in a, in a timely manner. Um, we may have thrown the military installations for a little bit of a loop, but moved up their reports to early on the earlier on the agenda. Uh, but had a really good conversation a couple of weeks ago on how to get better organized as far as managing just a, a huge amount of stuff that's going to be coming through our process this year and, and beyond. So really appreciate that. Um, two things I'll point out as far as remote meetings. Uh, we zoomed in on, identified a couple of dates for holding our board meetings in Teller County and Park County. I think we agreed on July in Teller and um, September in Park County. So more to come there. We'll start working on locations and logistics and, and all that good stuff. Um, and the last thing I'll mention on that, we we did talk, we alluded to this a little bit earlier in, in today's meeting, but we, we talked about ways to maybe do more federal um, elected official engagement with the board um, where maybe we have roundtable discussions with our federal delegation or two senators and Congressman Lamborn and maybe others that are part of our region as well. So we're going to be working on that to see how we can uh, have them, if they're a captive audience and in town for a week, um, have them meet with us around some of the key federal issues that we're dealing with, whether it's transportation, air quality, like we talked about quite a bit earlier today, or a whole host of other things that are really on our um, on our minds, because that drives everything that we do here. It starts with some kind of federal action. Um, but not sure if there's anything I missed that other executive committee members wanted to mention. Uh, we did kind of talk about uh, trying to get all the business in the meeting done between 9 and 11. And mm -hmm. when we have some of the trainings or specialists coming in that people are interested in, doing that more from 11 to 1130 in case people have to leave, have a hard stop. We, they, we can get through all the business that we need to take care of. And then um, having those taped and maybe you can watch them later as your as your time permits. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Hinges. Yes. Um, so first of all, actually, I think the structure and the times are working nicely. I would just give the real time feedback. I did have a question on the current committee commission vacancies on the memo. There's a lot of is this the actual members or are these really the vacancies? Because that's a lot of vacancies. If those are actual vacancies, here. correct, Jared? Yes, they are. A lot of vacancies we're trying to recruit for. Well, yes, it looks like they can't even be functioning. I mean, there, there's so many vacancies that how are they? Are they even functioning right now? Uh, most I are mean, you looking at, say, the CAC, for instance, they still they all still have a quorum. So we're not concerned about that yet, but we're just we're concerned about lost representation within your community, especially the CAC. I know we've had some issues there because they review pretty much anything that comes to the board um, for a recommendation. Yeah. Wow. And, I know the city, the city's had a few uh, vacancies for a few months now at least so we've been concerned about that yeah well along those lines like water quality management committee if that list is accurate there's 21 vacancies so how big is the committee if there's uh, 21 vacancies need some help on that i don't have that one in front of me but so i, I will say especially on some of those technical committees um you have every jurisdiction has representation you also have several other groups that are designated or targeted so while those are only the vacancies, you still have a lot of other people who make up those committees based on subject matter expertise. Um, sanitation do, districts, probably all the water districts, sanitation districts are, are represented there as well. The metro districts that have a water, wastewater um, operation. Well, I, I guess a question I have really is, and it would probably depends on the committee or the commission or the board, and and maybe they really want and need representation from from these um, entities or or maybe they feel like they're being well represented and it's functioning well. I'd be interested to know, you know, how how functional are, are each of these committees feel like they're really being and and do they need this many additional folks representat in representation? I, I don't know. It just it just begs a number of other questions for me about the functionality of the commissions. Sure. Good questions. We will take that back to them. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question to pose. Yes. OK, very good. Um, and just a couple of the things real quick uh, related to um, setting up workshops and other items on our agenda going forward. Um, we're trying to find a separate date for a Transportation 101 workshop. We've talked to, talked about that before, so more to come on that. I think we've got a few dates out there for trying to do that end of February, maybe it's early March. Poll. Every Everybody should have got a doodle poll from Cheryl in the last couple of days. So if you could take a minute, and please. Yeah. Uh, answer that doodle poll real quick. Yeah, there's been a lot of interest in transportation, how the funding flows, how it can be used in different parts of our geographic region and how they can't be used. 
um, and all of that good stuff. So really hoping to find a time where we can dig into that. Last thing I'll mention is uh, I've been reporting on our need and interest in hiring a regional grant navigator for months now, and we finally have a grant navigator on board. Um, I sent out an email, I think about a week ago, uh, but Jill Gabler has started a small consulting firm and she, along with a handful of others, um, put bids in to become our navigator and we selected Jill Gabler. Um, we think we're going to get great value. She understands the region, understands a lot of our needs, uh, great research capabilities and an interest there. So she can really hit the ground uh, running very, very quickly. And uh, especially compared with the good value there versus maybe hiring like a larger engineering or planning firm where we end up paying a lot more and maybe not getting as much uh, as much work out of them. So uh, she is going to be uh, meeting with us I know later this week as a kind of a kickoff orientation. Uh, session and then she will be meeting with uh, a handful of jurisdictions that have kind of risen to the top and, and keep uh, kind of uh, letting me know that uh, they've got a strong uh, interest. So she'll be out in your communities very, very soon. Yes. I've got a 1A, a 1B, and, and a 2. I think there's, yeah. I say again, amen, brother. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Vanderworth, your mic is on. Oh. Did you have a question? Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions for Andy on anything for his report? Anybody online? Okay, that takes us to member entity announcements. Anybody have anything exciting going on in February or March in your community? Commissioner Elder. Is, oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, It's not coming up. We just had it Saturday. We had a... Uh, a transportation uh, town hall in Bailey. We had uh, Speaker McCluskey there, our State Senator Mark Baisley there. Um, Shane was there. We had Lisa Hickey, the Transportation Commissioner there, and about, I don't know, 50 or 60 people talking transportation. Uh, it, it turned out, I think they were wanting to head a little bit into the transit side of it, but it ended up all about 285 and in, in uh, Bailey, which was a really good discussion. Uh, and I, I appreciate everybody that was there. And I just want to try to enlist everybody's help in uh, PPACG. And one request I have to the uh, to CDOT and the Transportation Commission, and that is to get the uh, the language of truckers downshift or die approved so we could put it on the sign at the top of Crow Hill because I think that would have a great impact. But uh, Commissioner Hickey and uh, the rest of CDOT has said that is not appropriate language, but we in Bailey think it's very appropriate. Thank you. That's a good tattoo. Yes. Yeah. I'd support you on that one. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Commissioner Hinton? Uh Yes. I, I promoted you. Sorry. <laughs> Councilwoman Hinton. I'd like to get that salary, actually. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, the, the city of Colorado Springs is um, getting ready to do its third reading on a, a water ordinance for the extension of water. And probably many of you have been reading about that. Um, what I what I'm kind of pleased to say is that out of that, there's uh, there's a meeting this afternoon with myself and Commissioner Bremer um, and the mayor of Colorado Springs and some folks from CSU to start talking about uh, setting up a water task force. To, to address regional, um, our regional water challenges and really kind of rising above and looking at the realities of water in, uh, development in the county, which is primarily water on um, non-renewable water resources, uh, coordinating with the uh, city of Colorado Springs and that water is primarily renewable water sources, albeit very stressed. So, so uh, I will just continue to report back on that. Nothing has started, no official com you know, commission or, or task force has started, but the conversation is uh, beginning today. And I'm happy to have input from anybody about Well, that. I know I spoke with Andy and said, please offer uh, our facility here, uh, if it would help with coordinating the meetings and Zooming them, recording them, um, free parking, all that kind of stuff. So great, great point, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, anybody else in the room with any member and an announcements and uh, Mayor Mayor Lekind? Oh, I'm sorry, didn't sorry. look to my right. Okay, I already First called. Building. Yes, there you go. Okay, we got one more in the room of Mayor Lekind and then we'll get to you. Yeah, and I was, uh, didn't know if Jeff was gonna uh, mention it, but uh, the long way to return at the Cripple Creek Ice Festival uh, is coming this month, February 18th through 26th. Yes. Is that right? February 18th through 26th. If you hadn't gone to it before the pandemic started, it's a really great event. Uh, ice sculptures uh, for two weekends and during the week. 
uh, and a great opportunity to get up into the mountains and see some really cool, really cool artwork made by chainsaws and chisels and all kinds of cool stuff. But invite everyone to come up for the ice festival. Thank you, Mayor Lekind. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I have an announcement. Uh, the town of Monument now has a full town council. We um, appointed uh, Laura Cronick, a, for, a, a current board member of Silver Key and former board member of the Monument Sanitation District. Uh, she was also the only resident that appeared at every single meeting of the Home Rule Charter Commission last year. Um, and we also appointed Marco Fiorito, who was a termed out board member of the Tribune Metro District and is a retired Air Force officer. Um, both of them are appointed through the 2024 election cycle, which means uh, that we will have people to join some of these uh, vacancies that were reported in the packet. In fact, uh, uh, Laura Cronick has already um, expressed interest in the various aging Commit committees that are out there. And so we're going to get her hooked up with uh, Andy and uh, make sure she has a list of uh, what's available. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Anybody else online? Okay. Last chance. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody.